going to. Okay. Well, looks like Wait. we're probably. Are you are you recording as well? I believe yes, I am. It says it's, it says recording on my end. How about you? Yeah, I think yeah, on my end as well. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank thanks so much for um agreeing to t chat tonight. Um. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Oh, what kind of um time window do you have here? I don't want to keep you keep you up too late or anything like that. Uh, I mean, I could like an hour and a half is. It's fine. Longer than that. Yeah. It depends on just how the conversation goes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, that sounds about right to me. Uh, but, uh, um, all right. Well, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been, um, following, uh, Bentham's newsletter, Bentham's bulldog, um, A very virtuous thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Since, uh, I, I guess I got on Substack uh, sometime in the fall and, I can't remember exactly how you came to my attention. You know how these things is, you know, I, I think though, I, I mean, my first memory of you and operation on Substack was in a comment section somewhere where you were very impressively advocating for animals and, uh, and uh, really sort of taking all comers. <laughs> I think there were six or seven people you were responding to. I mean, I I I was reading it as a historical document at that point, but uh, yeah, it looked like- you, I mean, I, Maybe it was the Hanania uh, comment. It might have been the Hanania one. I, I do remember that one for sure, where you were, um, I guess, defending his his position uh, in a sense to uh, to uh, uh, naysayers in the comment section. And uh, yeah, you were very impressive. I kind of got on Substack myself in in the fall with this almost like out of a sense of duty uh, to get in the fray a little bit and try to advocate for animals, try, try to be nice about it, but get in comment sections and try to do a little bit of advocacy. And uh, since then, you know, I, if something interesting in Phil religion or whatever comes up too, I'll, I'll, I'll peep in. But um, um, uh, so it was really nice to see you out there already having done so much. Uh, when, I, when I saw you out there, I felt almost like, well, maybe I don't actually need to be here. You're, you're doing a great job. <laughs> and Thank uh, you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, very powerful, uh, philosophically uh, rigorous defenses of animals, advocacy, uh, you know, and uh, uh, so uh, that's that's a major reason I wanted to chat with you a bit. Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, I, at some point I realized this guy's very young. <laughs> I, I didn't read your... Um, your intellectual autobiography until a few days ago. I, I saw I saw it there, and uh, it answered some of the questions I, I had for you tonight, actually. But uh, um, I, I had realized uh, just from little things you said uh, that you were pretty young, and that you had also begun your intellectual journey. You know, your serious direct engagement with modern philosophy, for example, contemporary analytic philosophy at a very young age. You you mentioned certain arguments that had occurred to you in high school. And so I got, I got kind of curious about you also as, as a philosophical personality and I uh, wanted to, maybe, maybe we can start there, you know, a little bit about your intellectual autobiography. Um, so uh, you talk about uh, little glimmers or moments uh, of intellectual awakening, if we can call it that, uh, uh, I think grade one uh, version of the problem of evil occurred to you, but you, some, I guess it was high school. You were 15, was it? Or uh, maybe a little uh, yeah, bit 15, six. I mean, it's, it sort of came in degrees. So like, um, I mean, I sort of have memories, uh, you know, I, uh, unsurprisingly, I come from a Jewish family. So, you know, we, we, you know, discussed many things and had, had arguments and such about religion. Um, and so, you know, I was sort of at least nominally interested in philosophy of religion for a while. I remember, you know, when I was 12 or 13 watching videos from uh, various YouTubers like Cosmic Skeptic talking about philosophy of religion. Um, I, but I mean, the thing that really got me in thinking seriously about analytic philosophy was uh, I think around 10th grade, um, I got into an argument with a friend about whether or not moral realism is true. For a long time, I'd ha very strongly had the intuition that moral realism was true. It seemed to me that there were certain moral claims that are true and that their truth didn't depend on anyone's attitudes. Um, but, you know, I, I started arguing with a friend about this and it turned out, you know, I was not, I mean, my friend, you know, he's a really smart guy. It turned out I was not able to effectively defend my position to him. So I just started, you know, 
probably not in a good, ep, you know, epistemically good sense, but I decided to start reading philosophy to sort of, you know, get arguments to use <laughs> against him in, in our ongoing debates. And so, you know, I read, uh, I started, re you know, working my way through On What Matters, for example, um, and, you know, reading other books about philosophy and, you know, watching debates with uh, people like Mike Humer. And so that, that's sort of what, uh, what got me into the topic. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, you just now finished second year college? Yeah. Yeah. My final exam was yesterday. Oh, great. Congrats. Yeah. I, I just got all the marking in yesterday too. So uh, uh, I'm done on my, I, I teach, uh, I teach undergraduate philosophy here at, uh, in Toronto. Um, but uh, um, yeah, it sounds like you've learned a lot. I mean, and um, d done a lot, you know, you've come very far in these few short years. It's uh, very impressive. It got me thinking a little bit about philosophical prodigies. I mean, we don't, uh, you know, you see real child prodigies in mathematics and music. Certain disciplines seem a little more amenable to child prodigiousness than others. I, I can't think in the history, I don't know if you can, in the history of philosophy of real like child uh, philosophical prodigies. I mean, there might be some legends from the Indian tradition, but um, there are some well-known examples of people publishing major works in the early 20s, right? Uh, David Hume came to mind. Uh, I think the treatise was out by the time he was 24. And A.J. Ayer uh, also was pretty young when uh, Language, Truth, and Logic came out. And I guess you're working on a, a book too on moral philosophy. Is this your... Uh, your first magnum opus on, on moral philosophy? Oh, well, no, I, I was kind of working on it a year ago. I mean, the problem, or not a year, like in high school. And the problem was, so I think I, I started in 11th grade and I basically stopped it in 12th grade where the problem was like, I was, I would just read back from some of the old stuff and it turned out like, you know, uh, the stuff I had written at the beginning of, of 11th grade, for instance, just wasn't very good. Um, and so I, you know, I decided probably a better bet to try to publish papers, for instance, and to, you know, write about philosophy on my blog, but, you know, just getting a book, you know, to the extent that one's getting better at philosophy over time, you know, if it takes them a few years to write a book, then uh, sort of like by the time they're done writing it, the stuff that they wrote at the beginning will be stuff that they won't find good. And so That's... it just makes, <laughs> makes better sense to kind of just wait a few years. Yeah, maybe, uh, might be also with moral philosophy, there's a kind of, you know, it's a vague term, but wisdom or something that comes with just a little bit of steeping. I'm not saying you got to be old to be good at moral philosophy, but uh, there's a certain kind of steeping of the ideas with the experience. And uh, uh, so maybe, yeah, maybe maybe by the time you're 29 or something, uh, things will uh, really uh, gel and you'll be a bit solidified and your brain will be fully grown. <laughs> I guess your brain's still growing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, um, maybe maybe we'll come back to your autobiography uh, at, at the end. We can we can bookend the discussion and we can get a little bit caught up because you published that intellectual autobiography uh, at the beginning of your uh, college year. Now we're at the end and you can maybe catch us up on some of the major uh, uh uh, updates to your worldview uh in the yeah, last there have been, there been some big ones <laughs> yeah i i got the sense maybe uh theism is 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 one yeah uh, yeah are you, are you cross the 50 percent mark on theism yeah i think so hmm. but but just just a bit um yeah yeah and then you know the other thing is that i um i i started thinking hard about anthropics where prior to this i mean i had sort of like thought about anthropics a little bit i had some intuitions about anthropics but I hadn't really studied the topic very much. And now I, I sort of did a pretty deep dive into anthropics. And so now kind of like anthropics is one of the areas of philosophy that interests me the most. Right. If you like, so if you were to start grad school tomorrow, you, you might specialize in anthropics. And Yeah, I, I'd either do ethics or philosophy, religion or anthropics. Gotcha. Yeah. Maybe uh, well, I guess it, it all converges too, right? So, uh, like anthropics and phil religion in in fine tuning arguments and whatnot, they they converge and ethics will come into it always, always, always uh, outside of pure logic, probably. But uh, well, even there, you know. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. Um, so I don't think it's any secret that you know by your moniker alone, one one knows your. Uh, 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 utilitarian, pure utilitarian, or as a utilitarian would call it, a utilitarian. <laughs> and uh, 
so your uh, your advocacy for animals, your attacks on factory farming, for example, are are always come from a very consistent utilitarian um, uh, background. Um, well, I mean, just briefly, I don't. Th so the arguments that I give for the wrongness of the way that we treat animals are arguments that will make sense if one is a utilitarian. But I think basically, no matter what views one has of ethics, as long as one is committed to extremely plausible and minimal ethical principles, uh, they'll they'll conclude that they're right. So, for example, um, you know, when a person eats meat, uh, if a person eats, say, a chicken sandwich, they're causing animals like many many days of extreme suffering for the sake of a chicken sandwich. Okay, here's a pro plausible principle that everyone should accept, even if you're not a utilitarian. You shouldn't cause others extreme amounts of pain and suffering for the sake of comparatively small benefits. Right. And so if that's right, then that means that uh, that eating meat in normal circumstances is morally wrong. So the arguments are they the wrong making features are in terms of utility, but any plausible view, mm. even if it's not a utilitarian view, will say that pleasure and pain are some of the things that matter. It'll just deny that they're the only things. And so uh, if, if you think there are some of the things that matter, then the argument still works perfectly fine because, you know, on any plausible view, you shouldn't cause others tons of agony for small benefits. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I mean, factory farming is just, it's its this hell on earth. It's, it's, it's almost a test of a moral theory that it can clearly unequivocally show us that it's bad. It would almost be a reductio of a moral theory if it couldn't, couldn't, couldn't tell us that factory farming is bad. Um, if that's not bad, then what is, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so um, for a utilitarian, um, I guess there will always be edge cases, right? No matter what is wrong, um, we can imagine a circumstance. I mean, we just need to, uh, you know, ratchet up the numbers in the other column. We can at least imagine a, a possible world where it would be permissible or even obligatory to uh, to do that thing, which is normally wrong. Is, is, am I using the term edge cases correctly? Here's yeah. That. Okay. So, um, so I, I'm just curious. Maybe we can. So, not just um, factory farming, uh, not just eating animals, but more generally in our relationships with animals. I guess. Um, um, ways we can cause animals suffering what would be some of the plausible like real world edge cases meaning meaning we can imagine situations on earth arising or situations in the past that have arisen where it, it would be permissible to uh, use animals so for example i think it's plausible that uh so there were certain so this is an example that peter singer gave in his book there were certain tests that were done on fish that were trying to establish how sentient fish are. And as a result of these tests, they got increasing recognition of fish welfare, uh, which improved the way that fish were treated. So that's a case where I would say that even though it's bad for those fish that are being mistreated, and that are being experimented on in cruel ways, it helps way more fish. And so as a result, yeah. it's justified. Um, in a similar way, so I, I think that for, for a, what a, an actual person should do, I think an actual person in the real world should be vegan because, I mean, for, for a whole host of reasons, rather than only eating happy animals, where one of them is like, of the people who think they only eat happy animals, most of them are wrong. And even if you're really confident that you'd be right, that you're only eating happy animals, to the extent that you're trying to convince others to only, you want to convince others to adopt a certain diet without being a hypocrite. And so to the extent that you are a vegan, then you'll want to try to convince other people to be vegan. But you, And if you're, you're, you uh, eat happy animals, then you'll probably try to convince other people to eat happy animals, that that's permissible. But you don't want people to think that's permissible, where if people think that's permissible, then they'll eat lots of unhappy animals. And really, you know, the extent of the suffering to which the unhappy animals uh, go is pretty extreme. I mean, I remember, so uh, I went vegan. It's hard, now it's hard to remember exactly when I went vegan, but... Um, I think I was like 16 at the time and like a little bit before I went vegan, our policy was, um, that we would only get, um, uh, the, the, that I convinced my family to adopt was that we would only get, uh, pasture raised eggs where the idea is that the pasture raised chickens are supposed to be treated better. 
And then I remember one day, you know, I looked in the refrigerator and it turned out we'd gotten cage free eggs. Turns out cage free eggs are basically the same as normal factory farmed eggs. They don't stuff five of them in a cage. They stuff 5,000 of them in a small barn where they can right. move around and they're treated badly. Right. So it's just like, um, you know, just as a real, like, you know, utilitarianism says there are certain edge cases where you should kill people. But a real world utilitarian should not go around their life thinking, hmm, you know, what are the cases where I might be able to kill people to maximize utility? In a similar way, a real world utilitarian should not be going around the, their life thinking, okay, you know, what, what are the edge cases where I can, can eat animals? Because, you know, just generally the consequences of that, uh, it's not going to be very good, especially when you've taken into account the second order effects. So there's evidence, for example, that if people eat animals, they tend to have less empathy for animals. They're less likely to, you know, uh, work to, to reduce the, the scope of factory farming. Um, yeah, and so on. yeah, yeah. I, I, um, last time I looked into the egg industry, I, I mean, even even individual birds that have a pretty good life, they come out of a system. I mean, you can always ask where where are the male chicks, even in in those situations, right? And they probably ended up in a macerator at the hatchery, if not on the farm. Before you know, um, the, the hatchery usually has the macerator or the garbage bags, and and then I think you also talked about somewhere. Uh, on on in the newsletter about uh, the genetic ma manipulation of the animal to get it into the state where it's an egg laying machine or a meat machine. So it's the very form of the animal at this point in our in the history of animal agriculture is is this kind of exploitive um, carrier, right? Um, most egregiously in the case of these birds who whose bones break under their own weight. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it becomes by, by this selective breeding, which is slow motion gen gen genetic manipulation, um, the very form of the animal becomes a kind of um, suffering. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I was um, very interested in this post. Um, on um, the disvalue of nature. Um, I guess it's a thing that's come, come up here and there um, through the newsletter. By the way, I've not read the newsletter exhaustively. I've, I've been following it since, you know, September, October, and then I've, I've checked back through the archives and yep. read things that popped out at me. But, um, but uh, I came to it late, but you had this, uh, and sort of drag up an old, an old post, but uh, uh, th this, uh, you called it the open letter to tree huggers. Um, you know, he gave it a provocative title and, um, it's, I guess, is it fair to say that's about, it's about the disvalue of, of uh, non-human nature? Yeah. Right. And, uh, um, you, you state, I think at the outset that a, a lot of people will find your conclusions, they're crazy or shocking, uh, something to that effect. And, um, my own, my own take like my own reaction um or, or my own framing i guess for reading that piece is you know i i, I don't think i've romanticized nature i mean i love animals i love mammals <laughs> particularly and so th th there's a part of me which can um, um see them in their very best light you know and euphemize them a little bit in the way i think about them not not cartoonify them but at the same time i am i am aware that Nature is morally problematic, uh, you know. Predation. We can start with predation, the great, great red maw of nature. And um, I guess if we're serious about utility, and as we increase in our powers, I mean, you hypothesize someone with the actual the, the proverbial red button um, hovering above Earth, and and have the option to just off nature, you know, by that button painlessly. You say. And uh, that, I guess we could say that's a picture of humanity at its engineering peak, at its ability to just kind of engineer efficiently on a planetary biosphere scale. And um, yeah, if we're serious about utility and and as we come into our engineering, almost kind of demigod-like engineering capacities, this is a question I don't think that's going to go away, you know, the question about what to do about nature. And um, so I... I love to chat a bit about that piece. Maybe you could uh, just briefly take us through for anyone who's curious about the pair, like for some people, there might seem to be a contradiction there where you're advocating for animals in the case, you know, in your tax on factory farms, say, 
And then you're also calling for the um, extinguishment of all non-human animal life. I mean, not. I don't want to see you're calling for it. That was a sort of, anyway, I'll let you uh, explain that apparent. Yeah, uh, well, so my view is that like all else equal, the existence of nature is, well, I guess not quite all else equal, um, but you know, if, if we just keep, keep the impact on humans constant and so on, we just look, ask, is the world a better place if there's more nature with more animals in nature? I think the world is a much worse place as a result of it. And I think we have serious duties to the extent that we have the ability to do something about the suffering in nature to do something about the suffering of nature. So it turns out there are, you know, many quadrillions of animals that exist in nature. There are over a quadrillion fish. There are, I think, you know, even more insects. And then you take a look at the number of earthworms. It gets really, uh, you know, truly enormous. Um, and then huge numbers and most of them live extremely short lives of intense suffering most animals are our strategists meaning they give birth to enormous numbers of offspring very few of whom survive very long and so for instance a tuna lay about 10 million eggs so now not all of the eggs hatch some of them will get destroyed prior to uh prior to hatching but the vast majority of them uh you know maybe you know several thousand will hatch maybe, you know, 50,000, you know, it's hard to know the numbers, but, um, and of the roughly 10 million eggs they lay, only about two of them will become uh, adults uh, who reproduce. And so that means that the overwhelming majority of animals, of the overwhelming majority of species live these really short lives where they live for a few days and then they either starve to death or get eaten by predators or die in some other unpleasant way. And so if we take suffering seriously, if we you know, think that it's bad when beings are in excruciating agony, then the fact that nearly every being in the world is in excruciating agony and lives a terrible life is gonna be very, it's gonna be very bad. You might think, you know, this is a sort of weird, you know, extreme conclusion, but I think we're very biased against this by the sort of beauty of nature and the fact that we don't take animals seriously. I mean, if, if for instance, anything like this was happening to humans, we would all say, you know, this is one of the big problems in the world. So for instance, if, you know, there was some machine that created 10 quadrillion humans, and then the vast majority of them starved to death, we would say, you know, that's a really serious problem. Okay, so then why, um, you know, when, when tens of quadrillions of animals starve to death after a few days, why is that not a serious problem? Well, you know, uh, there are a whole host of reasons a person might give, but I think all of those reasons will be very implausible. So for instance, you might say, well, you know, it's not a big deal because it's natural. Okay, but you know, if this machine that was killing humans uh, resulting in quadrillions of humans starving to death was natural, we would still think that it was a serious problem. Maybe the idea is they're not smart. Okay, but if the humans that were, you know, starving to death were not smart, we would still think it's a very serious problem. Um, and so taking that into account, I think, you know, that, uh, this ends up being a very serious problem. And so I, th I think every plausible moral view will hold that, um, that what's going on in nature is very, very bad. Now you might think, okay, you know, it's very bad, but getting rid of nature is even worse. But when you just take into account the scale of the suffering um, and you think, you know, imagine if quadrillions of humans were starving to death, even humans, you know, with slightly diminished consciousness, even humans, uh, who who were you know mentally deficient in various ways, we would still think you know that's that's one of the worst things in the world. That's orders of magnitude worse than anything else. And to the extent that we think uh, this, it, to the extent that we we're really serious about the problem and we think that it's orders of magnitude worse than any other problem in the world, then it'll turn out that you know <laughs> we should do something about it. And if reducing the amount of nature is one way to do it, uh, then then it's worthwhile. Yeah. So you're ultimately interested in the ratio of uh well i mean if 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 the pleasure of of the life outweighs um the suffering let's say let's say i mean starvation is prolonged but let's say predation um let's take that example even if you live for two days um if you're quickly predated at the end of it let's say the the pain of the predation lasts two seconds or two minutes and your two days, I mean, that's, that's many hundreds of minutes, right. Of, of let's say, okay. Or even pleasurable. I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be, uh, uh, I, 
<clears throat> a young tuna, but um, um, if I guess we before we push that button um, on the on the extreme R selectors at least we'd we'd want a bit more precise information on what that ratio is. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, I agree that before pressing the button, you should try to get information. But for for listeners who don't know, the idea is that imagine humans are going to depart Earth. We're going to you know set up a galactic civilization. And then the question is, should we press a button that would painlessly destroy all life on Earth after we've left it? Um, and my view is that in such a case, uh, where so it won't affect the trajectory of human civilization. And my view is that in such a case, we should press a button because animals have. Now, I think before you make that decision, you should do a lot, a lot of research to try to figure out the quality of life of animals. Um, but I think you know, if if it doesn't overturn the current conclusions. Then yeah, I, I think it would be right. Now you're you're pointing out that you know if you uh, if animals starve to death or if they die of predation, you know it takes two minutes. It's still a very small portion of their life. That's true, but it's a sufficiently bad small portion of their life that it's enough to outweigh the benefits of even fairly large amounts of utility. So you know, and and this is something that we normally accept in a human context. So imagine someone offer you the following deal. You live an extra two days, except so so what happens is after you die the first time, you get resurrected, live an extra two days, and then get eaten by lions. Do you take that deal? I said, no, you wouldn't take that deal. I wouldn't take that deal. No one would take the deal. Because we all accept that even, you know, two days of happy life is not worth the harm of being eaten alive, given just how horrible being eaten alive is. It's, you know, potentially many millions of times worse than even the goodness of a good moment. I also don't think it's obvious that in the sort of like moments when fish are swimming around, you know, looking for food. Maybe they're kind of hungry. Um, I, I don't think it's obvious whether their life is good or bad, but regardless of whether it's good or bad, it's just dramatically, uh, because their lives are so short, it's dramatically outweighed by the pain of death. What's the... Um, um, in, the in the example where I'm, I'm offered an extra two days of life to my 90 years or whatever, um, that the two de- the two days feel so paltry relative to my uh, natural lifespan that it doesn't seem worth it. But if if um, my my expected lifespan is much shorter, um, or if my my total life indeed is is that those two days, does that change anything? And I, I guess I guess I'm asking here about the phenomenology of the two day old being a little bit and and how well, time and well, so on is is perceived. Well, I don't know. So but... I mean, imagine a baby that. Assume, you know, suppose science uncovered babies aren't conscious at all until they're out of the womb. Okay, imagine a baby, um, like, uh, you know, is born out of the womb two days and then they get eaten alive. Was the baby's life worth it? I think most people would say, no, the baby's life wasn't worth it. Um, and to me, that seems right. Yeah. What about, so thinking about this, this, uh, called the red button. <laughs> Hopefully it has a little uh, plastic safety case on it that you got to flip up first. Yeah. But, uh, um, yeah. I mean, if we're at this galactical uh, diasporic situation and, we, we, you know, presumably our engineering and knowledge are at a very high level, I mean, instead of a button, wouldn't we want a large console with many buttons and faders and switches? And the idea would be, I mean, you... you I guess maybe another way of getting at what I'm asking here is, is non-human nature the appropriate category here, or should we rather be zooming in? And out? like you, you yourself distinguish between the R selection and the K selection. And I mean, it seems like there's a lot of life on earth outside of the extreme R selectors where, you know, it's maybe some of our mammal kin where they have you know, single childbirth or very small. Like, I'm not sure if a rabbit. Uh, I mean, just mom, mom, the has... red button, like, it's not like a proposal, like, you know. Yeah. No, but I it, it was just yeah. to sort of illustrate what, what the position uh, entails. Yeah. So I think, you know, if, if you know, if, if we ever get to the level of technological sophistication where we can basically blow up the world, like, we probably have the ability. Well, I mean, I guess we have that. <laughs> you know, we have nuclear weapons. But I mean, it might be worth trying to like stick around and make animals live good lives. Maybe there's a way to do that. It's kind of unclear. Um, but the claim is just like, if the only two options are leave things as they are or press the red button, uh, 
Those I think it's better two. to press the red. And button. that and that's just a way of dramatically illustrating the yeah the uh, a net sort of disvalue of the whole yeah. system. Yeah, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess there'd be a lot of creatures who, if they could advocate, would say, "Please, please don't push that button. Our form of life is pretty good." And I guess from behind, even from kind of behind, from behind an animal veil of ignorance rabbits might agree for example that okay i've got a four and seven chance of making it um through kithood into into bounding through the field and and uh, I'll, I'll take those odds you know they there might be taking it almost form of life by form of life there might be many um cases where they they'd want to continue that form of life um but as as you say the red button was just uh um a way of dramatically encapsulating the idea that nature has total disvalue. If we've got to, if we've got to adjudicate on its on its value, it's in the negative. And hence the red button. Um, well, um, guess one one question I have uh, when I think about your piece is to what extent we actually are uh, distinct from nature and and again just a little bit of background on where i'm coming from i mean i uh i i do think humans are are special in in the biosphere as far as as far as i can tell unless there are interesting things going on with composite minds and flocks and that, uh, i mean there might be a world out there that i'm not perceiving but from what i can tell uh, it, you know we are very uh, distinct and special and um but but i guess some of the things that you're worried about in nature you know let's let's say the the great red maw of of nature, of predation. Um, I wonder how distinct we are from that. I mean, um, you're imagining uh, an idealized humanity who who are setting out on this, um, you know, establishing this interplanetary utopia. Maybe not utopia. That's extreme. But but you know, in the same way, we can romanticize nature. We can ro romanticize human potential and. Of course, we have these potentials, but in our actual behavior, hence your attacks on factory farming, in some ways we seem like the the summation or the the avant garde of the great maw of nature. You know, we're um, that consumptive, uh, somewhat mindless, amoral tendency that we see in nature. We see it um, taken to an extreme competence in our in our case, right? Uh, of course, we have this conscience. Uh, in the species, sometimes it, it, it manifests in these sort of prophets at the margins, <laughs> whether the prophet is an ancient Hebrew prophet or a utilitarian uh, calling for the end of factory farms. There's, we have this voice of conscience and these moral ideals, but if you look at the actual behavior of our species, it seems like we're very much part of this system that you're calling for the uh, end of, right? Um, uh, I wonder I wonder how you think about that, about our distinctness from some of the very negative uh yeah, I mean, I, I think there are, there are various ways in which our moral sense has been shaped by evolution, such that we don't have empathy for beings that don't look like us or are sufficiently far away. And I think that's a real problem. And I think you know that's basically responsible for like most of the worst <clears throat> most of the worst things in human history, where slavery, factory farming, all sorts of horrendous war crimes that have been committed with impunity for nearly all of human history. All of those occurred because people basically didn't care about those who didn't look like them uh, or who were, you know, outside of their moral circle. Um, so, yeah. 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 I, I, I think, I think I agree with you. I think there's also this, um, just this drive life has, you know, the ambition of life, the, uh, appetite of life and um since i found in my own life i'm a pretty empathic person i think uh, you know by human averages but um i've had some phases in life i've noticed uh, sort of afterwards i noticed that like a particularly kind of uh, youthful ambitious phase like a couple years uh, of you know somewhat hedonistic exploration or whatever there were i felt like wow my empathy level was a little bit uh almost cauterized there for a time it was strange uh, you know to see it it's like even me like i i, 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 I and i'm no saint but i, I i'm like you know I, i've always been more concerned about animals than uh than average and uh 
there was a period in my life where I just, I just stopped caring. It was, it was a little late too. I, I, I've basically been vegetarian my whole life, vegan, vegetarian since like grade seven. But uh, there was a period in my thirties for about two years where just, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what was going on there in my mind. Anyway, I don't mean to do autobiography here, but my point is that there is this lack of empathy, but that lack of empathy is sometimes in a dynamic relationship with this drive or this appetite, you know, and I think part of what's going on in what we see humans doing to animals and to each other has to do with just people pursuing what they want and being very driven to that. You know, they're in, they're locked in some kind of game, whether it's an economic game, you know, their, their version of monopoly in New York city. And that becomes their sole concern. It just, it, it just uh, blinds them to other things that they might otherwise be sensitive to. And there are all kinds of appetites and games that people get locked into. And so that's that's something a little bit distinct from lack of empathy, or rather it, it plays with the empathy, right? Or it can, it can affect the empathy level. Um, so I think, I, I, I think that part of what's going on with humanity is uh, we're just, we're on a bit of a trip. You know, and yeah. we, don't have, we don't have time for uh, <laughs> caring too much about a lot of a lot of things. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the world yeah. has a lot of problems that can be difficult to you know do something about most of them. Yeah. Um, I mean that you know that's one reason why being an effective altruist is attractive. Where you know the world has a lot of problems, you can't do something about all of them. So you should do something about the ones where you can make the most impact doing something about them. Yeah. Yeah. I. Uh... I don't self-identify as an effective altruist, but I, I, I've, I've, you know, in my activism, I, I've done a little bit of kind of animal activism outside of just like intellectual advocacy. And um, remember, I, it took me a while to learn the lesson that there, there, there are things you can do that will make you feel good about, you, you, like you, like part of what motivates activism in many spheres is you just feel so bad about what's going on. You, at some point, you just you start doing something that you normally wouldn't want to do. You know, you, you, you take some action and it, it almost becomes easy to do it because you're so bothered by this thing that you want to push back against. And there's a funny way in which you can fall into a trap of repeated actions that make you feel good. They give you relief for that day, you know, from the uh, uh, frustration and pain about what's going on. Uh, but they're actually not that effective. And there were things you could have done which objectively would have been better for, let's say, like you said, for animals, which would have done more for them. And maybe would have made me feel just as good, or maybe wouldn't have made me feel quite as good, you know, but um, I mean, it's, we're, we're funny, we're twisted, you know, I mean, it can feel good to get punched in the face or something at a, at a rally. Uh, you go out, you go to a rally and you get punched in the face. I haven't been punched in the face, by the way, but uh, um, in such a situation, but you, in a funny way, that can make you feel good. It can make you feel you, you took a blow for the animals or something. And in the end, it might not have actually done much for them at all. And you could have done a lot more by staying at home and writing a blog post on factory farming or something, you know, and you know, while sipping herbal tea or something, you know, and, uh, and uh, so, so in, in that sense, I, I, I'm very much um, uh, on board with effective altruism, if that just means being reasonable about the way we expend our <laughs> altruistic energies. Well, yeah, I definitely think, you know, uh, if you're trying to better the world, you should try to do more good rather than less. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, that's basically the core claim of effective altruism. And then it has specific, you know, it's also the social movement that has specific recommendations about the ways in which a person can do more good. But, you know, the core claim is just to try to do more good rather than less. Do you... Um... Speaking of that uh, interplanetary galactic uh, uh, civilization, the sci-fi dream, I, I, uh, if you had to bet today, would you bet we will go into interplanetary and, and, and um, thrive, um, let's say over the next million years, or would you more bet on extinction? Um, I think I'd bet that we would go interplanetary. Yeah. So um, you're not worried that sometime in the next hundred years, whether whether from AI or some other um, apocalyptic machinery, we're we're going to off ourselves. Well, I'm very worried, but I I don't think I think you know the risks are severe and they're worth doing something about. 
but I don't think that they collectively add up to an event with above 50% probability. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, I sometimes worry about a different red button, you know, um, and uh, I, I don't have a sense of the probability here, but uh, I sometimes worry that, that you know, that, that 20th century image of, of, the, of the mushroom cloud, that's, that's like a, just the first, first glimmer of this age of apocalyptic machinery we're entering into. You know, that's a very dramatic image of a species which has gone apocalyptic in its potential. And I do worry about the, the way that technology tends to proliferate and cheapen over time, very <laughs> alarmingly quickly, you know, in the history of technology. And then I just wonder if the same thing will happen with these apocalyptic technologies to the point where everybody has a red button, you know, at some point. And then, and then to me, it just seems like it's, it's actually a tragedy because even, even a very benevolent civilization, just odds are someone's going to push that button, you know, get in a mood um, or I guess error is also a risk at some point, but um, I just, I do worry about that red button, that other red button that before we have the option of uh, eliminating all of nature, if, if we decide to take that course, uh, we're going to eliminate all of nature ourselves included on this kind of apocalyptic self-destructive. Yeah. Trajectory. I mean, I think that's definitely a risk. Um, I mean, I, I think a few points, first of all, is that uh, my sense of the, the, nuclear winter literature is that basically the agreement is that you know a nuclear war would be very bad but it wouldn't like lock the world in permanent winter so it would you know reduce the human population by a lot but i think humanity would would be likely to bounce back um and then second of all i think uh you know i'm optimistic that we'll get ai that very advanced AI will be able to solve most of our problems. Like, the, you know, the reason we typically have problems is that there's, you know, conflict over different people wanting different things. But to the extent that AI advances to this really, you know, enormous state of prosperity so that everyone can get what they want, then, you know, I think that that would remove the need for a lot of conflict. And then also to the extent that we go, in, that we're interplanetary, then one person pressing the button would be unable to, uh, to wipe out the world. Well, I guess if um, if the technology travels with us, then uh, we might need a decree, like in in the Dune universe, you know, where the, the apocalyptic technology is just banned interplanetary and can't travel with us. I, I guess the idea would be that what where, wherever we are, wherever our worlds are, are we'll have that apocalyptic technology, and it could be it could be in, the technology itself could be interplanetary well, by that point, you know, like uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> particle accelerators that suck up whole galaxies or whatever, you know. I, yeah, I, I mean that's that's possible, but the question is how probable is it? Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I think AI will largely determine the fate of humanity. Where if we can get aligned AI that follows good ethical guidance, um, then. Uh, I think, you know, that could bring about a, a very valuable, you know, that could reduce existential risks by a very large amount. Yeah. I wonder a uh, couple, couple thoughts. So I, I, you see people, the ultra wealthy um, enter into competition with each other for status. And, and in that case, you know, a hundred million um, it's just upkeep on their ultra yacht or whatever for the year. I don't know. Cause I mean, maybe that's a little high, but um... I remember I was reading an article and maybe it was by Scott Alexander talking about how there was some kind of yacht that various super wealthy people bought where the yacht somehow required other yachts to like <laughs> work for the movement of their first yacht. Right. Yeah. Yeah there's always a bigger fish, always a bigger yacht. And, uh, I just wonder about, again, it might be part of our, uh, evolutionary heritage um, tragically that, um, because partly because we're a social animal and we're so attuned to these status displays and signals that we'll never have enough. Right. Um, so that AI can't just by giving us what we want. I mean, it can, um, you know, ending world hunger or whatever. I mean, these things are admirable, morally necessary goals, but, I'm not sure that taking care of these needs will um, 
even if the minimum income was five hundred thousand dollars or something by by current by current um, by current standards or by current value, I'm not I'm not sure if that would eliminate conflict. Right, there'd still be social competition for status and that kind of thing. So, you know, the art market will go. <laughs> that Picasso will now cost five billion, not five hundred million. I mean, and, to the extent, like to the extent that we're all that that the ai can bring about you know really fantastic technology i think we'll we'll have better things to worry about than competing for status i i uh i wonder about that matthew i i i i i wonder if maybe oh you really think it'll be that easy to get rid i mean like, of I, like I imagine being... imagine the ai makes you know, makes some headset where when you put it on, it produces an experience that's like 5 million times better than the best human experience. Mm -hmm. I think people would spend more time wearing the headset and less time building, you know, big yachts. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe at that point it's game over too. That could, you know, it could be the, uh, the beautiful apocalypse of the, uh, the uh, infinite jest show that we can't, we can't take off. I mean, if it's that good, it, it would be like, fentanyl times a thousand or something you know better than yeah. fentanyl because maybe the it's... ai could take care of us yeah yeah we'll we'll be it'll be like the kubrick uber baby you know but we'll be plugged plugged in um amniotic like into this ai uh dream dream verse um that could be uh that could be heaven you know maybe the prophets foresaw it dimly and uh that's not quite what they didn't come about <laughs> it's this technologically enabled um heaven I guess I wonder. I just I just wonder about what kind of resources it will take to fund that that intense kind of um, experience for every every experience. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know the, the, that was just like an example. But I mean, the, the basic point is that once we have things, you know, a million times smarter than we are, mm -hmm. you know, the sky's the limit. Yeah, maybe that's the end of us. Yeah, could be. I mean, and I think there's a real risk that it would be. Yeah. Um, but if we can solve alignment, then I think like either we're doomed or the future will be really good if we get super intelligent AI. Yeah. 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 Interesting times, eh? The Chinese yeah. curse, we're living that. Yeah, we live in those times. It, it's 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 such we live in such interesting times. We 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 live at such a crux. Um, um it, it it makes me wonder if we're some kind of um, sim that focuses on this particularly intensely important period of life. You know, to what to whatever extent I I I I'm moved by some kind of simulation, Bostrom style simulation argument. It gets a little extra juice from the fact that we're around in this very interesting time, which would be if you're a game maker, say, or if you're an apocalypse sim um, scientist. Um, this would this would be a pretty appropriate time to focus on. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what else can we chat about? I did say I wanted to uh, uh, catch up on your intellectual autobiography a bit. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a a school year since you you published your your, your brief um, autobiography so far. And uh, yeah, why don't, why don't you let us know what's what's changed over your uh, your sophomore year? Yeah. So I mean, I guess. Two big things. One of them was I got very interested in anthropics. Um, anthropic reasoning is how to reason about one's own existence. The other one is I went from thinking theism was obviously crazy to weakly leaning in favor of theism, mm -hmm. where I think, you know, it, it makes good sense of a lot of things about the world, um, like the fine tuning of the constants, harmonious psychophysical laws, the fact that you exist out of the infinite possible people that could exist theism makes sense of that because plausibly god would create all possible people mm -hmm. the fact that you know there's interesting stuff happening at all our capacity for moral and mathematical and modal knowledge mm -hmm. um and you know all, all sorts of other things yeah so that's that's uh though you're just crossed over the 50 percent mark that's still a big shift from um from you know, near zero <laughs> yeah yeah thinking it's um was there a particular post or a particular author or particular or was it just there was just some cumulative effect that uh... i mean so i guess there there was one sort of like light light bulb moment where i was just i was reading andrew Hronich's book 
uh, where he argues for Christian universalism. He doesn't even argue for theism in the book. He just argues Christians should be universalist. Hmm. And as I was sort of reading about his his broad picture of what the theistic picture of ultimate reality is, or what the Christian universalist picture of ultimate reality is, it you know it just started to look very plausible that you know okay this might be what a perfect being would do. Now okay we still have to resolve the problem of evil, still you know have to think through the arguments. But you know for a while there had been this gradual buildup of arguments for theism. And it started, but theism just seemed obviously crazy to me. And kind of reading that was it made it seem like, okay, you know, theism is just one issue among many where one has to value the evidence for, for or against it, where you can't just declare it, you know, automatically crazy. Right. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, a big thing. And then after that, it was sort of like, you know, I was like, eight percent for a while and then it just slowly ticked up as i thought more about the arguments where i mean for atheism there's basically one good argument which is the problem of evil and it's a really good argument you know um but for theism there are all sorts of different arguments from uh just like you know i i and and one of my posts I, i have a post where i go through all the evidence both for and against theism and i think you know there are like 20 or 30 different pieces of at least pretty strong evidence for theism so it's just like, you know, theism be- best makes sense of so many of the features of our of, of the world that it ends up looking very plausible. You know, I've I've remarked that sort of similar to to, to evolution, where by you know there was a famous quote from a biologist: "Nothing in biology makes sense in light of evolution." Where you know, okay, you can come up with these ad hoc explanations of each of the particular things, but there are just so many things that evolution makes sense of. In a similar way. I think so much of the world is nicely explained by theism. So it's this very parsimonious theory. And then it, it adequately makes sense of just, you know, huge numbers of phenomenon, phenom, phenomena all throughout the world. Do you think in, in terms of other uh, anti-theistic arguments, I mean, are you not moved by um, any of the possible inconsistencies amongst the omni attributes or even the coherence of some of these attributes on their own, you know, like the omnipotent uh, argument against omnipotence or the, the paradox of omnipotence or possible conflicts among these, these attributes. Any of, do they, any, any of these, any of these weigh in at all for you? Um, no, I mean, they, these don't, these don't move me very much. Um, I mean, for one, I just, I think when you think through a lot of them, they just end up, collapsing the paradox of omnipotence for instance is resolved by saying omnipotence is just the ability to do all logically possible things and it's not logically Mm possible or uh, all metaphysically possible things rather Mm -hmm. it's not metaphysically possible to make a stone that god can't lift Mm -hmm. um so uh i I don't find any of them convincing and then i think even if i did like there was one or two that i thought of um that was convincing and you know there are some arguments against theism where like that I think they're not directly paradoxes of omnipotence, but they're sort of in the vicinity where maybe you think, you know, there isn't, you know, there is no one best kind of thing because, you know, you can always, you can always have things that are better than that. Um, now, okay, maybe, you know, maybe there's a problem for theism. Maybe it's not, it'll depend on, you know, how you formulate it. Um, but, but I, I don't think it, it'll be, it's hard for like, arguments that rely on these contentious philosophical premises to provide really strong evidence because it's it you know it's hard to know if the premises are right one contrast the evidence for theism from like fine-tuning but it plausibly provides like a, you know a thousand to one bayes factor or something um because you know it's just it's so unlikely that uh the laws where like like it's more like an observation about the world that's very surprising, and that can get you a very high base factor. Well, it's really hard to be super confident of the conclusion of any contested philosophical argument. Mm-hmm. Regarding the fine tuning um, data, uh, I personally I, I'm moved by it, but I'm always aware that I I so don't understand the, the physics. A lot of it's sort of deep physical cosmology and you sort of have to take it on the word. I mean, to me, it's impressive that there are a lot of fairly atheist or, um, you, you know, not, not pro theistic physicists who acknowledge that this is, this is extraordinary data that needs some kind of special explanation. Um, but, uh, I mean, how do you, I mean, 
Yeah. So if you have to, if you had to compare the multiverse option to like an atheist multiverse to uh, theism, which, which, which do you take? Yeah, so I, I think the multiverse is the best atheist response on offer. Um, so, well, so for, first, I mean, j just in terms of what you said about how we're sort of uncertain about the fine tuning, you know, we have to rely on what the physicists tell us and it's hard to double check and so on. Um, I, I, I sort of think two things about that. The first is there's a widespread consensus in physics around fine tuning, and there's a widespread consensus about fine tuning in a huge number of areas, like the cosmological constant, like the ratio of the mass ratio between, uh, you know, the two lightest quarks, I think, uh, you know, the ratio of the weak nuclear force to grab, you know, a, a huge number of things. So it would just have to be that like the consensus among physicists is wrong in like eight different ways. Um, and that would be very surprising. Mm -hmm. Second of all, even if it were, even if there were no evidence from physics for fine tuning, I don't think that the, the, the fine tuning argument rests on the evidence from physics. It rests on this much more basic conceptual point, which is that the, by far the most plausible fundamental laws, the, most, the simplest and the ones that are most likely don't, pro don't produce anything interesting. So it's not hard to come up with an infinite number of ways. You could have the laws much simpler than ours that would produce nothing interesting. For example, you could have all the particles just spin in a circle. Um, or, you know, go in a square or all move, you know, right at one mile per hour until they bump into each other and then bounce off or at, right. you know, any of an infinite number of speeds and so on. Um, and so, and then w once you have that, it's like the, the number of possible ways the fundamental laws could be, um, that are very simple, dramatically outweigh that are very simple and don't produce anything interesting dramatically outweigh the number of laws that do produce anything interesting. So we happen to hit, you know, the, this Goldilocks zone of complexity where the laws happen to be where we happen to get, you know, the, the series of laws um, that are, are able to produce something interesting. If you got, if you deleted any of the, any one of the laws, like, you know, suppose you got rid of gravity, nothing interesting would happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's very improbable that we got those, uh, this law um, that, that produces something interesting. I think when, when you have that conceptual point in mind, the multiverse stops looking so attractive because the, you know, the way the multiverse explains it is it's like, you know, you have this, you know, you have a bunch of universes. Okay, why do you have a bunch of universes? Well, there are two answers. The first answer is you might think the universes are just fundamental. They're just a bunch of different universes for no deeper reason. That's a very bad theory. It's not at all parsimonious. The better theory, the way that the types of multiverses that physicists seriously entertain are the kinds of multiverses where there's some simple physical process that if allowed to run generates a whole host of universes. So, you know, you'll have uh, um, uh, eternal inflation. I, I don't know any of the details about the physics where, you know, you start with these simple laws and then from that you get a bunch of universes or like string theory. But, you know, that's vulnerable to the same basic conceptual point, which is it's really weird that the basic physical laws are such as not to produce something just minimally interesting, but to produce a shit ton of universes. Like that's, that's not what you would expect. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be much simpler for them to just produce random static or nothing interesting. Um, so I, th I think that's the first point about why a multiverse isn't convincing. Just two other points briefly are number one that, so Robin Collins has argued that there's fine tuning for discoverability. So various of the constants of the universe fall in this narrow range such that if they were different by a little bit, we would still exist, but the universe wouldn't be discoverable. And mm -hmm. so if that's true, then the multiverse doesn't explain why we're in a discoverable universe. It just explains why we're in a finely tuned universe. And then second of all, uh, the multiverse, it, it was one of the more challenging versions of the fine tuning problem is the low entropy conditions uh, in the early universe. So the early universe was in this very low entropy state. Now it turns out that this low entropy state occupies, according to Roger Penrose, one part in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123rd of the available phase space. So of the of the ways the system could be, only one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd were in that low of entropy. Um, now it turns out if there were higher entropy, we could still exist. Uh, we, there would just, we would only exist as Boltzmann brains. So random <laughs> observers would pop into existence temporarily, have thoughts like ours, and then disappear. And so, even if you have a multiverse, then you would you, on you know sort of like most multiverse models, you would expect the majority of 
uh, observers to be these short-lived Boltzmann brains. But if you know that the majority of observers are these short, short-lived Boltzmann brains, then you should think probably you are a short-lived Boltzmann brain. Most of the people mm-hmm. throughout the history of the universe who have your experiences will, you know, just disappear in one second. And so I think the multiverse might have this unacceptable conclusion. Now, you know, the last, the two points I raised, I, I, I think, you know, the most forceful point is just the basic conceptual point about, uh, about, you know, the challenge is most sets of fundamental laws don't produce anything interesting. We happen to get one that produces something interesting. And so, uh, but even if you have a multiverse, a multiverse just still is a fundamental law that produces something interesting and is thus very improbable. What, what about a, um, a multiverse generator, um, which arises out of some kind of, um, natural selection process, you know, natural selection applied at the scale of the multiverse and beyond where you get out of something pretty chaotic with enough time and space, <laughs> uh, possibility space, tries, rolls of the dice, you get this pr- favoring of structure. And so structure comes, you know, structure, structure beats chaos, um, intrinsically almost, you know, by persisting where chaos doesn't. And so you give, you give the system, it's not worth calling a system initially, but, uh, you give that big, big mess time and tries and, or order emerges, right. And including, um, favoring of stable universes for, for, for natural selection reasons. And I, I, I guess if you, if, if you start applying natural selection logic to the multiverse scale, maybe, maybe that will help the atheist case there a little bit. Do you think, do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think it does because I mean, so in that case, you're saying there's some system where you get a bunch of universes and then there's some natural selective process where the universes that last longer are the ones that remain. But the point is the simplest sets of laws just are, are not, don't produce this process for generating lots of different universes, nor do they produce anything that might produce anything stable. Like just much simpler than any law that produces anything stable are just the laws that mean, you know, all the particles just move at some speed until they hit each other and bounce off in a random direction. Mm-hmm. If the laws were like that, nothing interesting would happen. So you, you need to get, you know, to get the things to fall in this very narrow range to have it even be capable of producing anything interesting, regardless of the mechanism by which it produces anything interesting. So for instance, John Conway had his famous game of life where you place down dots and then you, you know, you, you run the program and the dots evolve according to this deterministic system. And, you know, it gets interesting things where the dots start, you know, moving around in cool ways, but he had to work really hard to find uh, to find a, a sequence of rules that would produce something interesting because the overwhelming majority of uh, possible initial rules just, you know, didn't, didn't uh, make anything interesting. I guess if, 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 if we think of the initial chaos being this kind of randomizer where the, the uh, more interesting um, multiverse generator or the more interesting laws will, will, have a very low chance of popping into existence, um, you know. So they have to wait their turn <laughs> for the um, one in a trillionth die roll, or whatever trillionth to the power of a trillion. Um, but still, I, I just wonder if some kind of through just the logic of natural selection, if you just it, it it will given enough time, and maybe we have all the time in the world for this to to get going. Um, order will just arise through, you know, order, order will dominate, um, when it, when it takes hold, just like it did on a smaller scale on, on earth. Yeah. But the, so I, I agree that if the laws, so if it were the case that there was a natural selective process for order and the laws were such that if, you know, they just hung around for long enough, you get order, then yeah, you would, you would get, you would, you would indeed get order. But my point is that, uh, the laws the thing that's improbable is having laws that are capable of getting order at all. So, you know, if you had the laws that just, just the particles that bounce around, you know, there's no, they wouldn't form anything more complicated. They would just be constitutionally incapable of producing anything interesting. And that's true of the overwhelming majority of possible simple laws. And so, if if the laws are capable of generating a naturalistic process by which more interesting laws dominate, those laws are themselves extremely improbable. Right. I guess. I guess. Um, 
if if the logic of natural selection is necessary or something, right? Like it doesn't, I mean, it. in, in a sense, natural selection is always happening in any system. It just, it's happening very badly in, in a lot of chaotic systems, right? It, where order is, in, order is losing. Uh, but in principle, in some abstract sense, natural selection is always happening. Um, but nothing interesting might be getting selected in, in, in most most imaginable um, um, law-like systems. Um, but if you if you if we truly, I guess I guess what I'm asking for here is that we begin with a true chaos where it's like a, a, a random generator where everything every everything, including we're talking about systems themselves with their particular laws, each of those has a chance of popping into existence. And of course, the more interesting yeah. uh, legal systems are very, very unlikely. But I just wonder if through just the intrinsic logic of natural selection, which is always in operation, because these ordered systems, ordered, uh, the better laws have, have a chance of popping into existence, they will, given enough time, come to dominate. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, so if you have a system that's chaotic in the sense that it can produce a whole range of different things, then that might produce... Um, uh, that might produce universe. I mean, it, it seems like it would be more likely to, to produce a bunch of Boltzmann brains than to produce the universe. Ah. But, um, but, but, it, but the point is that that laws that generate this kind of chaotic system that is capable of giving rise to a whole range of outcomes, those laws are way less probable than laws that just by their nature don't can't produce anything interesting that just produce oh. particles bounce, bouncing around. Oh, I see. Yeah. So is the idea that uh, chaos is not so simple <laughs> that it, it itself, the, a, a just like it's hard to actually design a true uh, randomizer, uh, you know, with our technology. Um, it's when we think of a, uh, an, an, a primeval chaos, that's not a simple thing behind that chaos is some kind of generator so to speak. Yeah. Well, um, so it, if the chaos is, so I, I mean, the, the word chaos is, it doesn't have a super well-defined meaning, but if the way you're using the word chaos is it's some system that is sufficiently chaotic that it can give rise to a whole range of uh, possible things, including entire universes, mm -hmm. then something like that is very improbable. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, what if it's, it, it, it can't give rise to entire universes, but it can give rise to just like the, 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 the the RNA the early early world RNA kind of equivalent of a, of a universe you know um, just the very primitive beginnings of of these law like universes and then so what what we have today what we're looking at today and contemplating and fine tuning problem is is the outcome of a very long uh, uh, evolutionary process of the, of the universe form yeah well so the the idea is that in such a case. So, like, when I was saying it would have to be capable of generating a universe, I would still count that as sort of generating universe. It's just generating the universe in this roundabout way. So it has to be able to generate uh, these gotcha. simple universes, and then these simple universes have to be able to have some mechanism by which they grow. But, like, right. you know, for any – I, I mean, I, I, I can't think of any obvious ways of having simple laws that do that. But, like, for any law that, that, that does something like that, I can, you know, it just seems like there are going to be an infinite number of ways that you could have much simpler laws. Like, you know, here are an infinite number of simpler laws than the laws that give rise to chaos. Um, laws that say all the particles move in a circle at one mile per hour or two miles per hour or three or four for an infinite number of values. And so, you know, if there are an infinite number of theories that have higher intrinsic probability than, um, you know, the, than, than the chaotic world, then the prior probability of any particular chaotic world has to be zero. Now, maybe there are an infinite number of them, so, you know, it gets, <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, yeah. it's it's still going to be that the probability is maybe undefined, maybe negligible, but all in all, not, you know, not something that, that, you know, you should, you should, that, that you should expect to be very likely. So is, uh, so God is appealing, or at least 51% appealing as, uh, as a simpler explanation of the order we find around us. God, God, God itself uh, would be. A relatively simple, yeah, being. yeah. Um, I guess there's. I mean, are are you worried uh, about uh, just the mystery, uh, a displacement? I mean, Dawkins has 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 that uh, classic objection to design mm -hmm. arguments where 
we're displacing the problem of design to God and wonder if, you know, there's some kind of displacement that's going on here where we, you know, we displace all, all the mess of trying to explain the world onto this simple being, which sounds simple, of course, but there's a lot of mystery um, uh, there then. And we need to, we need to then explain how, uh, I mean, you're aware of all these kinds of problems um, and you probably have some great responses to them, which I, yeah, you can give me a couple, like, how does the simple being causally interact with uh, with, a, with with a complicated uh, material world, uh, for example? Well, so the simple being, being omnipotent, is able to interact with the complicated material world in any way that he wants. Now, I think I think God is pretty simple, and that. So, I have an article that I'll release at some point. Um, I, I, you know, I I have I often have some, or at least recently, I've had articles that I have written ahead of time because, you know, I'll write multiple articles in a day and I don't want to clog up readers' email or inboxes. Um, but so I have one that I've written where I argue that there are, you know, about 10 plausible routes to making theism simple. Or, you know, theism is just, you can get theism by taking some very fundamental thing like a mind and just not placing any limits on it. And so if you're a dualist about consciousness and you think that minds are fundamental, then you just have this fundamental thing without limits. And that's, that's an extremely simple theory. Um, it's much simpler, I think, than uh, you know the, the even the simple particles buzzing around. Or you take the the property of of goodness, and then you just you know have no limit on it, and okay, and then you get God. Um, and so so all of this is to say that it's very simple and intrinsically probable on accounting uh, on account of lacking arbitrary limits. Now something can be both simple and difficult to understand, but if it's simple and difficult mm -hmm. to understand then it'll still have a high prior probability. So for instance, string theory, it's very difficult to understand. Uh, you know, only people who are good at physics can figure out, you know, how the strings work. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a low probability because the the you know map the the precise description of what of what's going on in the system is um, uh, you know uh, well it is it does it is not difficult to describe. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm sympathetic to the idea that, uh, just a, a free consciousness is, is quite a simple idea. I mean, and part of that might be from just the prejudice we have of being subjectively, um, um, thrown into this, into this situation. I mean, that, that's, that's our orientation. So in a way it's the thing we know best and, and it's the, it's for us um primordial or primitive but uh, yeah if, if i mean i mean the, if, if 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 i wonder just kind of casually about the beginnings of things there's something a little surprising there in any story we tell you know if if if, if something came from nothing like just kind of pop like without any cause um grounding just kind of pop that's surprising but okay maybe maybe, I, maybe the beginning is going to be weird in any way you you cut it if there's just always been eternally a mind um that's a little surprising too but it's not that weird you know if, if it all began with just a simple primeval consciousness um that's that's not a weird thought to me you know i'm, I'm sympathetic to that that view wonder uh are you, are you sympathetic at all to the idea? And I don't really have any arguments for this. It's more like a, a picture <laughs> that I'm attracted to um, of this primeval consciousness, perhaps being being free when there's no world. But then once it once it creates a world, or precisely imagines a world such that it's inhabitable by other beings with distinct subjectivities and so on. You know, it's like this very elaborate dream that's so elaborately dreamt that the other denizens of the dream world have their own um, subjective um, gravity. Um, once, once, once the primeval mind has kind of created in this way, it loses some of its power. It's no longer free, I, I, I guess. Um, you could think of this as the creation kind of getting away from it a little bit out of its control, but um, I guess, I guess it would be, I, I mean, I know you're, you're, uh, you're also thinking about the plausibility of Christianity and um, you know, there's that central, um, central event in Christianity of the, of the, of the uh, incarnation and the sacrifice. And I sometimes wonder if that's 
almost uh maybe it was real maybe it was real but also it's 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 a um local incarnation of a more primeval sacrifice which of, of the kind i'm talking about where the primeval free consciousness um sacrifice its freedom to create a to create a world i don't know why it would be a sacrifice of freedom to create a world um you know still free to do whatever he wants with the world well take omniscience i mean um um, I, I, I'm I'm somewhat moved by one of these problems for omniscience, which is that um, my, you know, con consciousness is intrinsically private, um, and so even God couldn't inhabit me. Couldn't have that kind of an indexical knowledge of of my life. Um, could know everything objective about what's going on in my and and be very astute about me psychologically, you know, extra perfectly astute about uh, to the point where God could absolutely predict every every thought I'd have, but would still maybe, <clears throat> I mean, maybe at that point it's indistinguishable from indexical, um, I, subjective knowledge. But uh, I just, so so the idea would be that God could know what your experience is like, but God couldn't like there's some knowledge that you have that God wouldn't have, which is you have the knowledge that I am Paul Bali and God doesn't have that knowledge. Yeah. That would be the, the problem of the indexical. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that doesn't seem like a limit on God's knowledge because God knows everything that's true. It's mm -hmm. not true that he's Paul Bali. It is true that you, you're Paul Bali. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's not, it's not that um, like, like everything, like there's no knowledge that God lacks. There's no true po proposition of which God is aware, unaware it's just that there are certain true proposition, propositions that are true of people other than God, but not yeah. true of God, of which, um, like, like, I mean, and here's one way to see this. Um, suppose that God, so it can't be the case that both possessing and not possessing some piece of knowledge, both are absences of knowledge. It has to be for, for that either you knowing P or you not knowing P is an absence of knowledge. But if, if God thought he was Paul Bali, then it would seem like he is lacking knowledge. He doesn't know who he is. Um, yeah. He's mistaken yeah. about who he is. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 like, I like this approach to the, let's, let's call it the indexical version of the problem of omniscience, where, uh, yeah, if, if, we just, if we just put God's um, lack of knowledge here in terms of lacking the indexical framing, um, it almost, I, I, I guess put that way, the problem does seem almost trivial and and we we might not require god to have that that knowledge it might be a, a, analogous to your response to the paradox of omnipotence where i mean we just require god to be able to do what's logically or metaphysically possible to do and here we just require omniscience is just the requirement to know all that's logically possible to know uh all that's true and god can't truly know that i i God and Paul Bally. That's the contradiction. And uh, I, I, I like that. I like that response. Maybe, okay, so here's a, here's a more um, embodied version of the problem of omniscience where, uh, you know, where God can't know what it's like to be tr truly afraid, you know, um, or to learn, you know, the pleasure of learning um, an omniscient being can't know that. You have to be limited to know these, to know these things and to have these very valuable experiences, you know, overcoming odds, um, conquering your fear, um, learning something, growing. These are things God can't know or experience. Um, how, how do you, like, what's your response to that kind of uh, problem of omniscience? Oh, well, so I, I, I think that he can know, um, he can know what it's like to learn, even though he isn't learning, where he, he has access to what it's like to learn in the same way you might have access to previous mental states that you had. You're not currently having those mental states, but you can you have awareness of what it is like to have them by virtue of having a mental state that, that gives you that awareness. And similarly, God has the awareness of what it's like to have that mental state, um, even though he is not capable himself of having the mental state. Now, in terms of whether he's lacking something, well, it's not true that God has ever every type of good well actually i mean maybe it is actually because i i actually don't think there are that many types of good i think maybe the goods are like 
uh, hap- like pleasure and relationships or something, um, or maybe knowledge. But I, I don't think learning is intrinsically good. Learning might be instrumentally good, mm-hmm. but, but I don't think learning is intrinsically good. Like you wouldn't want to forget knowledge just so you can learn it again. <laughs> um, uh, n- now, um, it, it's not, it, the idea is not that God instantiates every type of good the idea is that God is the best kind of thing. So he instantiates the combination of goods that are maximally good. Mm-hmm. So, you know, God, uh, you know, God doesn't instantiate the good of, um, you know, like, uh, uh, eating good food. Cause you know, he's, he's just not the kind of being who's in the business of doing that but he does instantiate the best sequence of kinds of good. So he, you know, God, I think it would be infinitely would experience infinite pleasure. Um, and he, except maybe when he's being crucified. <laughs> um, and then um, he would, uh, you know, he would, he would have infinitely intense relationships with an infinite number of beings um, and so on. You don't think learning's a good um, or heroism. You don't think these are, intrinsically good things um i don't think they're intrinsically good um yeah um and i think even if even if you you do think they are intrinsically good then it's not a problem for theism because again the idea is not that god instantiates every type of good there are different types of goods that are incompatible the idea is that he instantiates the sequence of goods that are best you also might think maybe you think that, that him instantiating heroism is is good but maybe you think he just does like, you know, maybe he does in our universe. Um, if you're a Christian, maybe this is especially plausible where, you know, there's something sort of heroic about, you know, sacrificing yourself, you know, dying on the cross uh, for, for humans. Maybe if he doesn't, he does it in another universe. Maybe he does it in ways that we don't know about, you know, maybe God was secretly like became incarnate as a person or, something. you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to know. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the God I like to, to, think about I, I don't know if i'd quite say believe in um but the god i like to uh i like to imagine would be more motivated to create a world out of concern for goods like heroism and the process of learning than than pleasure pleasure's got to be part of that you know p- pleasure is like the base currency in that world and uh pleasure and pain and then but there are these second order you know like i think mackey in his uh, classic article on on evil talks about these some second order goods that operate on the, the lower level goods. And, uh, I think, part, I mean, I think, I think the logical problem of evil is partly solved by the existence of these second order goods, uh, the, you know, um, um, yeah, which logically require, um, certain kinds of suffering or, or, or negative states, you know, not just causally. Cause of course, God being omnipotent, as you point out somewhere, um, um, we can't get them off the hook for evils by pointing out that they're required for some good. If those goods are just available by taking yeah. a causal shortcut, right? But yeah, you, you, uh, you might think that sort of like the best kinds of relationships involve some suffering. Or if you imagine two people yeah. who, you know, they begin in a very intense state of relationship, you know, it just lasts forever. You know, it seems like there's something better about if, you know, if one spouse, you know, gives up his wife or the other, and then they're reunited yeah. in the afterlife, and then they live infinitely long <laughs> after that. It's like, you know, yeah. that seems better in some way. It seems like their their relationship has more value. Yeah. I, I, I'm almost, I, 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 again, I, I don't have an argument for it, but I like, I like this uh, picture of the, of the universe where part of it's the impetus that brings it into being is this mm-hmm. moral, this, this desire for a certain moral narrative to, to be enacted, you know, that, I mean, you can imagine, I don't know, some, Hindu God and and his consort lying on the couch of eternity, in in this relationship of, of eternal um, love, but but almost that relationship demands um, to be expressed in terms of these these narratives of heroism and sacrifice, right? Like here we are in the couch of eternity where nothing can touch us, but in a way the love needs to be tested or something in, in, in a situation in, in these kind of sort of counterfactuals if there were if the, if we weren't infinite um this is what i would do for you this is this is what my um um boundless love would look like it would look like maybe failure even you know like a tragedy but um almost of course if they're divine they don't need to actually enact these things um they can just they would just know 
in the infinity of their intelligence that they would, in these hypotheticals, sacrifice for the other, and they wouldn't actually need to bring a bring a world into existence. But uh, I guess then I wonder if maybe our world is just the, their uh, precise, precisely imagined hypothetical. You know, that um, that that's what that's what the world is. Yeah. Again, not... Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I do think that a, a theist should think that, um, you know, uh, forging relationships is one extremely important function of our world. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, like, what, what, what do you get the man who has everything? Christmas that was a tagline and some old that it was for like a bronze shave, electric shaver, but uh, back in the eighties, but. Uh, Sometimes wonder, wonder, wonder that question aloud for God. You know, if God, trying to have sympathy for God as the eternal being prior, prior to creation, and trying to solve the problem of why there's a world. You know, it might be, it might be to bring about these things that he sort of ironically doesn't have <laughs> these limitations. You know, that that are are in a way become these like expressions of the the counterfactuals or the hypotheticals about the eternal. You know, if I were limited, this is what I might look like. You know, I think that's part of the idea of the incarnation that we're supposed to we're supposed to look at the incarnated God and and solve it a little bit or transcribe it, transpose it to the infinite, and see that in the in this earthly behavior, there's a clue there about what the eternal God is actually like. This is this is what it would look like if you put it down on the ground like the little Google Maps guy and made him walk around. Um, so. Yeah, this is well. Uh, well, Matthew, uh, it's really it's really been a pleasure talking to you. I, maybe I don't I don't want to keep you too long, and uh, and and we've covered some nice ground there. Um, everything from the uh, uh, value of nature uh, to um, theism and a little bit of autobiography and a little bit of ethics. Um, I'm sure people are always coming at you with counterexamples to utilitarianism from from the deont deontological side so i won't i won't inundate you with that and I, I know you've probably got in your back pocket 20 great responses to whatever i could come at you with anyway so i won't uh, won't um undertake that exercise of futility but um just want to thank you again for advocating for uh for the voiceless and i hope you think a little bit more about the value of nature i i, I like i told you i don't have a great uh an awesome objection to you on that. Um, and I share some of your um, concern about the value of nature, if you know, I don't wanna, don't wanna romanticize it, but I do also worry about ways we romanticize human potential, you know, and um, also, you know, we, uh, we emerge from this very problematic mother, if I can anthropomorphize nature, um, very recently, you know, very, I, I accept we're distinct in some ways. Uh, we've got our head above that water a bit now, and but it was, it's so recent that that all happened, and you know, um, that womb of nature is problematic as it is. It might might still have some other things it it has to output in the next. I mean, what will squirrels or ants or rabbits be in two million years or ten million years? I know that's a lot of lives, a lot of our selecting lives to be gobbled up. Um, but uh, but still, it's it's a sliver of time in the in the in the huge machinery of creation, maybe. Um, yeah. And relative to the relative to the infinite future of the uh, rabbitoid intergalactic utopia, right? <laughs> but no. anyway, anyway, I, I really appreciate you uh, chatting with me today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. I, I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, and I look forward to your uh, near daily posts. I, I I don't know how I want maybe be, just before you run off, I, I I want to just autobiographically ask you quickly about other writing and reading. Um, you know, I know I, I haven't I know you've got a Goodreads channel. I haven't checked that out yet. So for the reading part, I can just go go see what you've been reading. I'm curious about what you read um, outside of philosophy. I, I you mentioned Enter's Game in, in a post, and um, but. Uh, in terms of writing projects, I mean, so much of your writing is taken up with the blog and with uh, schoolwork. And um, I guess in your career, in your imagined career, just, I don't mean in the professional sense necessarily, but just in the trajectory sense as a writer, do you 
can you see yourself moving into, I don't know, like even writing fiction or something uh, I, I, you were really yeah. good at I, the, the post, the post where you're um, putting a defense, uh, uh, was it a, you know, you're imitating the voice of Trump and Chomsky and uh, Tucker Carlson. They were attack, atta were they attacking or defending Scientology? I forget. <laughs> but uh, they were just saying various things about Scientology. That's remember. right. Yeah, I don't think Trump was happy about it. But uh, um, um, that 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 voicing was was wonderful. I mean, just from the words on the page, those voices were really popping off for me. And I remember reading that and thinking, you could, I mean you could you could write comedy or you could i mean yeah there's obviously a lot of humor in the blog already but i'm just curious if you you see yourself ever writing fiction or something outside of um philosophical essays yeah i mean so there have been various times when i've tried to write fiction and it's just it's always sort of failed disastrously <laughs> I, I you know i i find it, it i find it very easy to write like you know, a few thousand words about, you know, something I've been thinking about, but I find it very difficult to write, you know, a huge number of words, you know, span, you know, about, you know, about this large overarching plot of, of something like a book. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, may, you know, maybe I'm, you know, I, I might write a short story at some point on my blog, but I think it's uh, relatively unlikely that I'll like write a fiction book Right, right, but you know these uh, these um, thought experiments become like cool little short short stories on their own. You know they've got the I find that the thought experiments that really stay with us culturally um, have a kind of mythic narrative um, resonance. You know it's very deep. You know like Mary in the room. Yeah. And there's there's something there's something archetypal going on there that that just it's it's more than just a contrived cute thought experiment to make a point. There's something yeah. I, uh, yeah, almost myth mythic in the in the scope or depth there, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you know, if you read Borges, or I mean, the, you get these little short short. It's fiction in some sense. I mean, you shelve it <laughs> on the on the fiction shelf, but it's, it's almost it's somewhere in the neighborhood of philosophical thought experiment too. You know, it's just a little bit of narrative energy, and so I don't know, maybe maybe um, just these thought experiments that you're spinning, which you seem to spin so. Uh, so easily. If we ever talk again, I, I might pick your brain a little bit just about phenomenology of philosophical discovery. And because you're so fecund, you know, I'm a little bit curious about how your mind generates ideas. Like I think you're ref you're ref you're reflective about that, and you'd be um, a good one to talk to about that. But uh, anyway, um, it's it's late, and uh, I, I should I, I should let you go. And I just thank you again for yep. chit chatting tonight. Yeah, well, it was, it was very nice uh, chatting. Good meeting you. And yeah, thanks. Take care. Man. All right. Should I... Wait, am I recording? Or no, I think you're recording. I'm recording here. I'll stop it now.